that's all they were, were the nuns. That's right, that's right. So um, this group of the RSHM was founded in 1849 by Father Jean Gaillac in Bessier, France. And today, the RSHM is an international congregation of Catholic women who serve others through diverse ministries in 13 countries around the world. So in honor of our faith-driven founders, we're sending you this delicious bottle of wine that is from Languedoc, Roussillon region of Southern France, where the RSHM order first began as our token of gratitude for your participation and support of Marymount. And I, I don't know how many of you know, if you knew this, Anne-Marie, but the RSHM used to have a, um, their own winery. They have their, they used to make wine. That was one of the, they're very entrepreneurial. And that's what, that was one of their enterprises that they had. I never heard of the one until you, so I'm so happy. I don't know how the ones kept it quiet all these years. We would have loved some, you know? I know, and that's why they're so happy because, you know, this is probably the wine that they made because it's the wine of the region, which is, which is a dry rosé. So uh, while 2020 has been a challenging year for all colleges and universities, things are looking up here at Marymount. Like I mentioned to you before, we have been moving forward with the implementation of the goals listed in our five-year strategic plan called Momentum which aims for national recognition for innovation and commitment to student success, alumni achievement, and faculty and staff excellence. To make that happen, we are focusing our efforts on four pillars, embracing our distinctive identity, offering transformative experiences to our students, fostering a vibrant community, and ensuring a sustainable future. So our, I don't know if you are have been watching, but this year we climbed again uh, the best college ranking. And for the second year in a row, the US News and World Report, it placed us now number 31 in the region. And that means, uh, so we continue, we moved uh, 31 slots last year and another six. So we're very excited of, of our uh, really rapid move in the US News and World Report ranking. And we're also number one for most international students and number two for campus ethnic diversity. Also moving up in best colleges for veterans and best value. We are also offering a variety of new academic programs and we continue to innovate our curriculum. We are now offering fully online degree options primarily at the graduate level in education, nursing, and also in physical therapy. Uh, uh, we are also at the graduate level offering these uh, very innovative stackable certificate programs where our graduate students can actually build their own masters by stacking different certificates together into a master's in emerging technology. And then I also mentioned to you that we're embarking in completely renovating our IT infrastructure through the implementation of Workday. Uh, we already launched HR and throughout the pandemic, which we have been putting our financial systems in the cloud. And uh, we'll be starting soon the student component. So it's a very exciting time for all of us here at Marymount. And in today's happy hour, we're going to put the spotlight on uh, one of our phenomenal fine arts program professor, Sarah Hardesty. Um, we have been fortunate enough to have her as a faculty member since 2016 and she has gained great recognition as the recipient of one of Art Fairfax 2020 Artist Grants. These are highly competitive individual grants that recognize the exceptional work of Fairfax County artists across a range of disciplines that include visual arts, creative writing, theater, dance performance, choreography, film, and new media. Sarah uses drawing, painting, installations, and sculptures to present experiences that connect with our core feelings through the physical landscapes of our lives. She has been, she has been exhibited and has received awards and residencies across the US. And this includes over 50 successful solo and group exhibitions, nine awards and residencies, and 11 grant awards. 
She has been awarded residencies at the McDowell Colony, the Mokwasek Project, the Carriage House at Eastlip Art Museum, Santa Fe Art Institute, and Vermont Studio Center. In addition to teaching and being a working artist, Sarah's professional experience includes directing profit and nonprofit galleries, curating, grant writing, and website design. Okay. And prior to, I don't know how you do all this, Sarah, you're amazing. <laughs> but prior to joining Marymount, she taught drawing, painting, and foundations at Cowboy College in New Jersey, Wesley College in Delaware, and at the University of Arizona. She holds an MFA in painting from the University of Arizona and a BS in studio art from Skidmore College. I'm so happy to have her aboard. She's a valued member of the Marymount family. Everyone, please give a warm virtual welcome. <laughs> Professor Sarah Hardesty. Sarah, to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Gosh, what an honor <laughs> to hear all that from you and um, to have you all be here. Thank you for inviting me to, to do this and for you all to um, also being here and for your support of Marymount. Um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen in a minute and talk through some of my work. I do drawing, painting, and installation, um, as Dr. Becerra said, and I'm going to show you there's a lot of work I've done over the years, and um, I am going to show you a little bit what I used to do in early 2000, and then kind of talk through what I've been doing over the past three years. And I just want to say that I'm happy to have this be a dialogue. Um, you don't have to ask questions while I'm speaking, but if you do want to, please feel free and know that that's perfectly fine with me. Um, I don't know how uh, you want to moderate it, Bethany, but that would be fine with me, just so you know. And um, I'll try to be careful not to spend too much time on any particular thing because I wanted to be able to show you the snapshot that I selected. Um, uh, long, and you're kind of like, well, how did you do that? Um, and please think of this work website. My apologies in advance for any technical difficulties. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm freezing now. I'm sorry about that. Well, hopefully it won't happen too much. I don't know what to do to change it. Um, that's the only thing. I don't have anything. If it gets to be a real problem, if there's any way to get Bethany, if you want to take over, I don't know how that would work since I'm hosting it, if it matters on my internet, but hopefully not too much. I'll just, I'll just get started and we'll, we'll see. Guys over. I can't also see you guys that well um, because I'm going to be looking at the images with you. Um, so can you all see this okay, hopefully? Yes. Okay, thanks. So I wanted to start out where I am, not right at this exact moment, but where my studio is for my, my art and that, that part of my practice. Um, I have a studio at the Arlington Art Center. It's a wonderful space. It's probably my favorite studio over the years. I've had studios in New York City and Arizona and lots of different places that have all kind of been really wonderful. But this one has beautiful, I think I have three other windows in addition to this one. So I have five windows and a great community. And um, yeah, it's just, it's been a really wonderful experience there. And it's not that far from Marymount, especially the Boston campus. So this is my studio. These are some works that are kind of recently done and some works in progress. And um, I just wanted to share an image of my space with you guys. So these two pieces are from 2013, and I've always worked kind of in between drawing and painting and installation. So they feed off of each other. And I find that um, if I only do one for too long, I kind of need to shift. You know, I need to mix things up a little bit. Um, but I, I used to work uh, with a lot of detail, very controlled and precise. I used to use a lot of animal imagery that ended up being more about birds and it had a lot to do with thinking about having your feet off of the ground and not necessarily having that stability and control of being rooted and being home. So that's something I've gone um, back to in my work very often is this idea of home and then also this idea of the fear and the unknown. Um, so a lot of these works um, were really, really precise. So I was using pen and ink for a lot of the line work that you can see in there 
and then acrylic paints with a brush and some gouache paint. And people would often think that they were prints because of the precision. Um, and then here's the detail of divide. Um, I don't know if you guys are able to see the images, but the one on the left is release and the one on the right is divide. And they're silhouettes of bird imagery, which I, I did use for probably about three years. And I've gone back to it a little bit. You'll see at the end. Um, it's a nice full, full circle thing, I think. So um, this is a detail of divide. So you can kind of see some of the line work there. And, um, you know, I was very into kind of creating an abstract environment, but with some tangibility. So I wanted to give the viewer something to hold on to and grasp onto, but then also create it so that it wasn't just so definitive. Um, the white is the white of the paper, and um, there's kind of two, two birds coming out of this one bird. So process has always been something that's really important to me. And with my drawings and paintings, I often work very intuitively. I respond to what I see. I might have a plan. So with the bird drawings, I'd have this kind of general plan, but then I would look at it and see what needs to happen next. I would put it up on the wall, and I tell my students this all the time, you know, put it up look at it, try to get a, a different perspective and see if it's complete. Um, so it's very much about the process. And um, I, I continue to do that. And this is just a, a detail shot of some of the uh, paint on the brush. So you can kind of see and get that, that tangibility of what's happening with the surface. Um, this happened before those drawings, but these kind of installations and those kind of drawings I was doing kind of simultaneously in and out from about 2009 to about 2015 or so. Um, and I made a lot of installations with found wood. And I was um, thinking a lot about finding something that's discarded and giving it a new life. Looking around, seeing what's, what's around me, what I can use, especially for sculpture, you know, not having to spend materials and also being able to create something hopefully either beautiful or aesthetically pleasing or at least interesting and uh, uh, enriching to somebody out of something that's been discarded. So these pieces of woods, uh, wood, I had a, a studio in Williamsburg in New York City and it was in a very industrial area and I just found these pieces of wood uh, around the side of the road and everything. So um, I would paint them with gesso, multiple layers of gesso, and then I strung them up with masonry string. This is at Davidson Contemporary in New York City. And there's um, lighting the piece was really important. So creating that shadow was a big part of the piece. And if you don't know uh, much about installation, you know, it's basically a sculpture that needs the space to give it, to let it be. <laughs> so imagine that the space is kind of the canvas or the paper. And I, I knew that I would make this piece in the space and actually a funny, I don't know if it's a funny story, but kind of an interesting experience, I would say, an informative experience is this piece sold through the gallery, which was wonderful. And uh, the place where I had to install it, it was being installed, I think, 20 feet up. So it was a very different piece. A big part of this piece was that the viewer could come up to it and have it look like all these pieces of wood were kind of coming at them. Um, but it was a safe, safe piece. So um, this is another installation I did around that time called The Impact of Optimism. And another thing that's kind of been uh, in my work throughout has been this kind of positive and negative, you know, taking a, a potentially negative situation and viewing it in a positive way or trying to give it a new life, whether it's just, I don't really think it is black and white, like positive and negative, but this back and forth between how you view something. And so the movement with something like this is, you know, is it exploding and coming apart? Is it coming back together? Um, how is the viewer going to perceive what is happening? Is this like a positive thing or kind of an intense, maybe not so positive thing? Um, so I had the installation installed in the space with uh, looking like these pieces of wood were kind of impaling the walls. And I have, um, as long as it, it works and isn't too choppy for you guys, it's a short little video. Um, there's no sound. It's just 30 seconds if it, if it shows all right here. So you can kind of get a sense of what it's like to see the installation in the space and to walk through it. So it kind of looked like the pieces were, were hovering in the space and you could walk into it, you could look under it and the pieces of wood on the wall weren't painted and the pieces of wood that were kind of coming out were painted this bright fluorescent pinkish red. It looks very red here. It was also kind of pink. It changed depending on the lighting as often happens with color. I guess there is some sound, <laughs> but it's very minimal. Um, so that was also in the gallery. Um, so 
installation and drawing, you know, I, I was doing a lot of work uh, related to both of those, those styles that I showed you uh, for, for about five or six years. Um, then I just kind of continued to work on a smaller scale. Um, when I started focusing on teaching a little bit more, that took a little bit more of my time. And then after I moved to Arlington in 2016, that summer, I was invited, uh, commissioned to do a piece at the Artist Circle Fine Art space. There's this old barn from the 1800s in uh, North Potomac, Maryland. And they found me through this wonderful organization called the Washington Project for the Arts. And um, you can list there as an artist. So they found my work, they invited me and gave me some, they, they paid me to do this piece for an event they were having. And I got to be on their, in their space and look around and kind of think about what piece I wanted to make. So I used wood from their space, old discarded wood that was kind of rotting. I took chrome vinyl that I adhered to one side of the wood so you could kind of see a reflection. And then I strung the wood uh, from this tall ceiling. And I'll show you a short clip of this one too so you can get a sense of the space a little bit better. But I kind of, I wanted to create this wall that uh, some of the wall was being held back. So it's, you know, my work is abstract but I am kind of referencing something usually at some point. So this for me was this fence or this wall where there are places where you could come through and it was called Passage or yeah, it doesn't exist anymore. I have the pieces. So this is a, a short video of Passage. Um, it was a really great experience. I hadn't created an installation in a couple of years before this. I had just been working small scale. So I very much um, enjoyed walking around the space. It's beautiful if you've ever been up in the Potomac area in Maryland. It's just a very, um, it's a very beautiful place. It reminded me of a certain um, part of my childhood in Vermont very much. I felt very connected to home. And I was thinking a lot about structure and safety and you know, things that are, are built environment and what's around us and how it can kind of dissolve and explode and come apart and, and still. And this is so to use the steel wire because they paid me for the installation, I was able to use some materials I might not normally use. In the past, I had used strip that I, I was able to use. So hopefully you were all able to see that. It does say my internet is unstable, so we'll see. So this piece um, came after that. This is now, I, I responded, I really liked the, the vinyl and the mirror and the reflection and thinking about layering and time. And I, I was invited to do a piece, a site specific or an exhibition, it didn't have to be site specific, at this small, small, the smallest gallery you can imagine <laughs> called the Metro Micro Gallery in Arlington. And it was about as small as um, maybe, a, uh, maybe bigger than a bathroom in some of the houses in Arlington and Falls Church area. So um, I wanted to create a site specific piece that really responded to the space that it was in. And um, I created a, a space that could be viewed at all times because this gallery wasn't actually open to the public. You had to create, um, you had to create a specific um, uh, event for you to see this, the inside of the space. Um, so I created a piece that you could see whether you were outside or inside and I created a different experience for both. Um, so the, the thing I liked about this piece is also as the day changed into night and the night changed into day, it changed the view of the piece. So the piece, this is all the same piece. I have a couple different images to show you. The piece on the left is an image of it during the day where you can't really see the light behind. So I had a fluorescent light behind this uh, wall basically of chrome vinyl. And on the right is kind of evening where it's, or dusk, it's getting a little darker. You can start to see the light. So the light is on on the left. You just can't see it because of the change of lighting. And I will say the image here is of ripples of a surface of a lake. And I won't get into it too much because again, I'm trying to show you a lot of work in a, in a kind of short amount of time here, but it was a very personal piece and had a lot to do with loss and memory and um, looking through and layers of time. And as I was making the piece, I could see behind me, you know, most of the time, which was this really interesting experience to be out on the street, kind of by myself, cutting. I have an image here uh, later on of me cutting all the, the vinyl. And I felt very protected, not that I felt scared, it was very safe. Arlington feels very safe to me living in, in other areas, but I could see um, behind me while I was working on it. And then this, um, so on the left here is an image of the piece at night, so you can really see the light behind. And then on the right here uh, is the fluorescent lights that I put, I installed in the space and I had them covered with this 
fluorescent pink covering. So it kind of created this illusion of a sunset. Um, so if you were to come in, you could see the interior workings of the space. And during the opening, people were allowed to come in and, and see the work um, from the inside. And then there's just a picture of me, you know, hand cutting. In my ideal world, this, this was going to be manufactured by a vinyl company. That was in my head. And when I told them what I wanted to do, they basically said, it's going to cost, you know, thousands of dollars to do all that intricate. It just wasn't going to work. Um, <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'll just cut it myself. And I did. Um, it, there was some technical difficulties with this. If anyone's ever experienced vinyl, these are huge sheets of sticky vinyl that are supposed to go on to the, the glass cleanly with no bubbles. And it was, it was a, a mini disaster for a minute. And then I was able to get some professionals come and help me install the vinyl. Um, usually, you know, I do a lot of the work myself, but this was something that I really needed uh, assistance with. I couldn't do it all myself, which I kind of have that like I can do it, you know, <laughs> let's see the challenge. Um, but I did cut the vinyl myself and it was a really nice experience. As you heard, you know, I, I'm very active. I do a lot. I have little kids and I teach and blah, 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 like all this stuff and, and getting to sit there and just cut the vinyl. Although I knew it was time consuming. I listened to music again, you know, seeing the light change, getting to see people behind me. It was a really nice experience. Um, I enjoyed it very much. And for, for I will say for the installations, you know, I do have to have a plan. So it's a little less about the process and responding, although I need to do some of that, but because it's on a larger scale and it involves a space, I need to have a, a plan with that. So you can see people on the left, that was during the opening uh, reception. So people could come in, you can see the door, it's a very small space. And on the right is just an image. If you were to go up to the window, you can kind of see, see through and see what's beyond. And then in uh, 2017 and 18, I had a biz arts in Rockville and I created this piece for that, uh, for that exhibit. I didn't have a studio by the way, during this time, except in my basement in Falls Church, which was getting smaller and smaller as the kids were needing play space. So it's interesting to think about this piece and I kind of planned it out and did some experiments with weight, but I really didn't make it until I installed it in the space. And it's um, an old installation that I cut up that was from a tree from our property in Gardner, New York, when we lived there. And I kind of, cut up my own installation and then reinstalled it in a new way. And I balanced it out. So the piece is balanced just on a, um, a nail in the wall. And so it's just strung around the nail. And then the, the plank on the right is covered with chrome and it kind of reflects the past. So it's called bound and it's very much about time and thinking about different formations of things. The wood is a plank. The wood is just pieces of wood that have been cut and severed and gone through different life. They were from a tree that had been um, zapped by lightning. So part of the tree had fallen over, but it wasn't removed yet. So there's a lot of history involved with this piece. Um, so those were really time consuming, those three installations, really wonderful experiences that I had. I was so happy to have all those opportunities to do that. And I just really felt like everything at Arlington, there was just this lots of good things, good vibes going on here. <laughs> um, and I feel uh, really, really honored to have those opportunities. So I also worked in, um, this is the beginning of a new series that I started. And now I'm pretty much just going to show you some paintings and then some drawings. Um, but I made a lot of works that had to do with covering up pieces and scratching through and showing what was behind it. And so if you think about things that were happening like in, in throwing light, the piece with the vinyl within the space where you could look through. Some of the things that are happening in the paintings are responding to the things that are happening in my installations and vice versa. Even if I'm not exactly like, I'm going to do this, it just kind of happens. It's part of that process. Um, and this piece I made after I did the piece bound that was at BizArts with the orange um, sticks tied to the other plank of wood. And so I did I had a studio space now with the art and I am from Marymount University. I've applied and then it's been, it's been given and they've been very helpful for me. And one of the main things was to be able to have an, an, uh, a studio space, the Arlington Art Center and get some new materials and make new work. And um, one of the things I was able to do is get out some of my old paintings and I started reworking them a little bit. So this, um, this was an old, piece and I, part of why I wanted to show you those first drawings is because this is from that same time 
there's a large, large silhouette of a pelican that's made with lots of um, different marks of gouache back, or acrylic, sorry, acrylic wash back and forth. And that I painted over that while showing some of the past. And so that started to be something that I was doing in my work. These two pieces were from that same show that the impact of optimism was, that one, the video I have of the red piece. It also had paintings in the exhibition and it was my first solo show in New York City. It was a very cool experience. And these paintings were from that show and um, they were so tight. And I remember at the time, rushing to get this show together. I didn't have enough time and I was trying to make smaller works on a larger scale. And um, anyway, these were very tight paintings and I saved one. I had these series of three that were like those first drawings, but on a larger scale. And I ended up just covering them and kind of letting go and shutting that past and letting it be reborn into something else. Um, these were two pieces that I put together. And then there was this really, you know, the bird on the right, it was so painstaking, you know, not, not painstakingly, it was very, it's very satisfying to do those crisp edges, but it was very precise. And then just kind of globbed on some paint over it. Um, and I was working with oil stick now because I had the studio, I was also able to get some new supplies like oil stick. And I started to respond and, and work into some old pieces. This is another one uh, of an old painting in the, in the background. You can see the line work. And I had, I had made some pieces that were like the installations that I did, but on, um, but on a two-dimensional version, basically different planks kind, kind of being held with strings in this abstract environment. Um, and I just covered it with oil. And I had a very interesting conversation with somebody about you know, honoring things that you've done and you know, not necessarily covering them. Um, but it was really important to me to kind of create another layer. And I have been over the past year or two thinking a lot about geology and the landscape and the environment and things that happen with the earth and how that connects to things that happen in our life. And I've been thinking about the layers of the earth and things moving and other things coming, you know, thinking about an earthquake and stuff like that. So, um, you know, lava flowing over. So a lot of this relates to that stuff as well. This is also a painted over piece that you can't really see what's happened in the past, but it's there, I know it's there. And I called it another story. So it's a lot about, again, the past being underneath. You can't always see it, you know, it's there um, in the history of something that's going on. And I'm also thinking more and more about, again, these geological things that are happening in the earth, subduction and shifts and shifts in the, the earth's um, crust and things like that and what's going on underneath the surface. Um, so this is all oil stick, kind of oil stick drawn into oil stick. And then I just wanted to mention, so now I'm just gonna show you a few drawings. Um, once the pandemic happened, I was, even though I was able to go to my studio a little bit, it was very, um, much not happening and is still very much not happening. Um, so this is this new opportunity for me to work in my sketchbook. And that's what I've been doing. I've been making drawings and paintings on paper. It's been really freeing and really interesting to respond to what's been going on, to think about home and space and people and you know not being able to see people in your life necessarily. And so the next series of drawings are they, I think they, they kind of all, they relate to what I've done in the past. And they're also specifically on paper because that's the means I can do it. And I don't feel, I don't feel bad about that. It's just a little different and it's, um, it's an interesting process. And, you know, I know we've all been going through different things and it, it's, I do try to think of things with a silver lining and try to think of the positivity. And that doesn't mean that nothing's ever not hard, even if that's my goal and that's what I do, it, there are still hard times. And I've really connected with how art has helped that process for myself. And it's something I teach to my students very much too, is you know, really how to, how to use art as something to transmute what's going on. Kind of like art therapy or something, and very much so. It's just that I don't have that um, experience specifically, I guess, to teach a student, but um, that's what I've been doing in a lot of these works. So that one was called Shift. This one is called Reflect. And they're kind of small scale. Um, 11 by 14, I have some six and a half by 10. This one and these are recent um i did some so i i'm just gonna stick now i don't know if one would say it's realistic this is a horizon um a lot of arrest i'm doing a lot of erasing in the graphite and then i i did a few pieces with birds which i thought was interesting this is a pelican um, flying over the water and it's called touched and you can kind of see the reflection in there it's 14 by 17 and then this one's a small six and a half by ten again that first one called shift 
was also six and a half by 10. So it's a smaller sketchbook um, called Liminal. And um, there's a bird in there. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's way in the distance there. And it's kind of flapping its wings over the surface of the water and there's its reflection there. And it's all in graphite. So I'm really kind of keeping it simple right now. Um, that's it. This is a, another picture of my studio I wanted to end with. Um, this is the space that I had before the space I have now in the Arlington Art Center. This one specifically, um, I got a grant for called the START Grant from Marymount, which was extremely helpful. And uh, I just want to make sure that since we're Marymount community, you know, um, I do I do mention the grant, and it's definitely on my CV. But I can I can just say that here that it was very instrumental. I got to have the studio. I didn't have the burden of paying for it. Got to be part of the community and buy new materials and make new works. And you can see on the right here, these are some of my pieces of wood from the passage piece that I started to create this really long line. It was a beautiful studio, very tall walls. And I started to create this just long line. So thinking about a new installation um, and my studio mate at the time took this picture and I loved the, the shadow and the reflection. And um, yeah, you can just kind of get a little sense of my space. So. I know I talk kind of quick, but I, I was really excited to share and kind of think about a little little short um, version of what I've been doing over the years. So thank you. And hopefully it wasn't hopefully it wasn't too too choppy there. <laughs> hopefully it wasn't too choppy. That's it. Sarah, I assume you welcome any questions people might have, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Um, how much does the actual um, studio cost? Um, because basically, my daughter's studio is the room that we're <laughs> sitting in, and I have we have a wall full of canvases and art supplies oh behind us. So abstracts. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> hoping to get her into something else. How much? How much is a studio? Like well, that run. Yeah, so Arlington Art Center, it's a residency. So I didn't mention that, but it's yep. a it's the residency. So you need to apply and get get admitted, um, you know, get selected, I should say. I didn't I didn't get it the first time I applied and then I applied again. Um, so it's competitive. Um, so it's not reflective of the prices. I can tell you what other studios cost in the area because I looked when I got the I got the grant, I thought for sure I'd get the studio, and then I didn't get in, but then I got in. To that that other space in the Arlington Art Center, um, so that studio, I'd say the space that I have now, I think it's about a little over three hundred square feet. Maybe it's three twenty five, and it's um, with with utilities. I think it's four thirty a month or something like that, oh, which is okay. like a really good price. Um, yeah. That's a really good price. That's that's about what I was paying in New York, but it wasn't as nice of a studio. Um, Very nice. Yeah, but we I don't I have to say that I here in Florida. Otherwise, she'd be in the basement where <laughs> you were. <laughs> yeah. Very it's, impressive. Uh, I saw I saw other spaces in Fairfax that were five hundred dollars for about a hundred square feet and not a nice space. Okay. So yeah, and I'm sure when you were in New York, it was unbelievable. Prices, right? New York, New York was was a little crazy. You know, I I again that kind of optim yeah. optimistic. I, I was like, I'll find something. I had a pretty good, I think my studio there started around under 400 and then it went up a little bit every year, but it was a good find. It was a good find at the time. And it was in a group, again, a group of artists that was run by an art framing company and they were also artists. And it, I had a few studios in New York, but that was the last one that I had there. So Yeah, it's your space. Yeah. Yeah, one of, I wanted to, you to talk a little bit about our students because I have been a year over year to the senior, the capstone presentation, and I'm always so impressed that they are biology majors or nursing majors or not necessarily art majors and their work is extraordinary. And I'm also have been impressed how they are so open about sharing personal um, personal challenges that they have faced in their life and they've expressed it through art. So um, I remember a last, well, last exhibit that I, I went to see some of the seniors, one of them, you know, she had fought um, eating disorder and she expressed that through her, through her art. So. Oh. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I think our yeah. art program is extraordinary in that sense. 
Yeah, I remember that actually working for an art nonprofit right now, based in Virginia. Um, that I think who you're thinking about might be Amanda Bone, but she used old pill cases and she made this beautiful framed piece with velvet in there and kind of selected the, the pill cases to go inside. Um, she did some sculpture. I think that um, the students at Marymount that I've been teaching with and that I've, I've uh, I should say, been part of their process and to hear what goes on for them at all levels, like not even the students that are, that are developing their work, getting it and get to, getting to think about content but even students that are working, I'm um, teaching 2D design right now. And there, there are some students making incredible work and, and being able to kind of, I think, find a haven in it for themselves and with the community. Even though, you know, for certain online aspects of the class, they're able to connect with others through the work and um, spend time using a different part of their brain. I talk to the students a lot about that and I get feedback from the students a lot about that, about, um, you know, all of the work that they're doing in their other classes, if they're not art majors, or even if they are art majors and they're taking all these other classes, it's like this mental cleanse. The amount of focus it takes, the different part of brain that they're using, um, it, and they see the accomplishment. I mean, I've had students in drawing one that are definitely not art majors, that definitely don't know how to draw, but they put the work in. I mean, it's, there are some students that naturally know how to draw, and so they can put the, don't have to put much work in, but they still, they're feeling connected. And I have students that don't, necessarily consider themselves artists when they begin and then they go on to take a drawing to or to become art majors um, or to think about how they might utilize art later on even if it's not an undergrad they might want to then apply for a graduate program in art and I know many artists that did not necessarily even do their undergrad and get an art degree but then that gives you content you know if you're I've had man so many students have been biology majors majors specifically and they can just they can just draw. There's something about it um, that I've seen uh, even back at University of Arizona when I taught there. I met a pre-med student was one of the best um, I'd say drafts people in the class. But um, connecting to content is a way for the students to process things that are going on with themselves, things that are going on to society. Um, drawing too, we they're learning new skills and developing kind of how to use color and how to incorporate new media. But we start talking about how to bring content in the work. How do they want to, what do, why did they want to make the work? And why do they want to make the work for somebody else to see it? Like it could, it could be that they really want to make the work for, their, for themselves to process a trauma or how they see the world or whatever they might want to make the work about for themselves. But at some point, especially if they're art majors, we ask the students to think, what do you want the viewer to get? You know, this is a form of communication, a very powerful form of communication and a way that you can um, impact people. I mean, you think about how many images we see. So you have, we have a lot of power with, with art for ourselves and our own individual growth to be part of a community. I mean, over the years of living in this world over, you know, more and more, I realize what a good friend being an artist is, especially if you're alone or in isolation. It's something just like, just like other things that can be that too, you know, yoga or exercising or whatever it might be, but it, it's definitely um, it's been a source in my life and I know that it'll always be there and I communicate that to the students very much and I definitely always at all levels let them know however they want to incorporate art into their lives they can I mean I love having the art majors I love seeing their growth and development but even if they can't do it for whatever reason and they're on a, a specific career path that doesn't involve art I let them know ways that they can be involved later on you know going to artist talks going to openings it's such a wonderful vibrant alive real and if you start thinking about the art world maybe there's some some not real stuff in there too just like with anything but i i communicate that to them and always show the students artwork so you know contemporary artists and historical mm -hmm. artists in 2d design and drawing one we're, we're looking at what they're doing and how it relates to the contemporary art world sarah this is ann um you know, I, I just picking up on what you talked about, you know, we're talking a lot about our new programs and uh, ideas for interdisciplinary uh, certificates and, and, and degrees. And I'm thinking about, as you're talking, I'm thinking about my daughter who um, did um, O-level art in a British school and then went on to do a minor in uh, music performance in college and just graduated with her doctorate in occupational therapy, you know, very unrelated. Mm -hmm. but. 
she was able to, I mean, art is always a part of her and she's always going back to drawing and the music she was able to incorporate, she's able to incorporate it in her occupational therapy practice. You know, when she was doing an internship once there was a, a nonverbal autistic child who hummed and she was able to um, establish a path of, of communication with him by, by she recognized that he was, you know, using tones for communication. And so she was able to use her, her understanding of music to, you know, to help establish a path for communication for this child. So as you're talking, I'm thinking about, I'm, I would love to have a conversation about ways that we can expose more of our students to art and to think about how we can um, incorporate um, art into some of our, you know, some of our health profession programs, for example, our nursing, as we talk about optimal aging you know, um, art therapy, you know, things have, you know, are there ways that we can expose students to art in a way it's the, where it's not just take an art class or, you know, major in art, but to, to expose them to the ways that art can impact their, their chosen profession. I guess. Absolutely. That would, that starts to make me think about interesting course development too, mm -hmm. or a special, you know, uh, you know, we could see how a, a course goes, like not an art appreciation, but some kind of more mm -hmm. general course that taps on a lot of different things that mm -hmm. could be very accessible to a lot of students. Um, yeah, and it made me think, we, we did have the students in my drawing two class, uh, when was this? Gosh, it might've been last fall. We went to the biology lab and mm -hmm. we were able to use some of their resources and draw from their specimens. And I think that, you know, I was just reading about um, biology students in particular, because mm -hmm. I was thinking about this too, like how we could incorporate art into, into other programs. And um, there's something about, you know, when you write something down, mm -hmm it goes into your mind a lot better than, I mean, I guess it depends on the mind and, and the learning experience, but I know for me very much, if I write it down first, it goes in there and mm -hmm. I don't have to look at what I've written down. And so for the, for the students that are looking at specimens or studying, you know, patterns or whatever they're looking at, mm -hmm. if, if they're drawing it or have the ability to draw it rather than just take a picture, they might sure. be able to notice different things. And a lot of, in, especially in drawing classes and drawing one in particular, it's a lot about learning how to see, you know, and because yeah. we're looking at things so quickly these days, you know, stopping, standing back, trying to notice details, um, you know, not trying to just take what we see right away and, and just take time with something. So yeah. That's incredibly it. important. I mean, biology students are all the time having to draw, you know, to, to as, as a form of note taking and uh, for testing, they have to draw. Um, they have to draw the hand, they have to draw the circulatory system. They have to be able to draw that. They also have to be able to see as they diagnose, you know, to visually take in the person that they're looking at mm -hmm. in order to diagnose what's going on with them. So it would be great to have, you know, to, to recognize that and to build some of those, you know, experiences as lessons or as, as separate courses or even certificates into, into some of our programs. I would love to just talk more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I just want to point out that the name of the wine is Anne de Joyeuse. <laughs> You're at the bottom, Anne de Joyeuse, Anne of Happiness. So, this is Anne thank what you. Can I say? You're welcome. Anne we Anne. <laughs> two, two Annes of Happiness, hopefully. Here. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, Anne Marie. Well, also, feel um, free to. Yes, anybody else has a. Patricia, Christina, you guys have any questions for Barry? Any questions for for our celebrity faculty, Sarah? Yeah, I just hope my daughter has a chance maybe one day to meet you or to take a class with you or something along those lines. You're very inspirational and you really touched on a lot of the um, emotions that go into artwork. Thank you. That would be really nice. Hi, this is Patricia. Um, thanks for the invitation. And the art is beautiful. Um, I actually had to just sit for a minute and just watch it, especially when you were running the, the video. I thought it was great, made me feel good, and just really kind of to sit still for a moment, which I thought was wonderful and here in the process. I especially like the fact of how we're coordinating the art into learning in other ways which we don't think of as educators. We just, we, we think of ourselves in separate 
and in little silos, like art is art. If I can't draw, eh, you know, and then we think of other things. But when I listened to what you guys just said a little while ago, it just, it clicked for me. So thank you again. Patricia and Christina, if you um, if you don't mind, because we didn't get to introduce you in the beginning, do you mind maybe yeah. Patricia sharing who you are and what your relationship to Marymount is? I know because our office helped coordinate, but I'm sure our friends here would like to know. Sure. sure. Um, um, I'm Patricia Hayden, and I actually took a curriculum development program at Marymount, um, enjoyed it immensely, just love it. I'm, I'm an educator by trade and I manage all of our education program for a nonprofit association. Me too, Patricia. And Christina? Hi, Hi uh, my name is Christina Dungo. Uh, our son Joshua Dungo is in Marymount taking a fashion and merchandising course. Uh, he is in his junior year now. So he, 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 he likes it, <laughs> he enjoys the Marymount, <laughs> but he likes to be in class instead of the online classes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. You have to ask who knows yeah. Gina. Yeah, I, I just wanted to share a little bit about why we decided to welcome students back to campus. As you mm -hmm. know, back in March when COVID was beginning to take a toll, uh, we had to uh, switch to remote because it's not, I'd like to uh, differentiate it from online because it was really the same classes that we were teaching, the same small student to faculty ratio, we teach, we switch to remote education. So it's different than online because people understand that online is like one professor and hundreds or thousands of students. Here is the same 12, to, 12 student to one um, relationship at, at most, you know, that's kind of like how our classes are very uh, personalized, very intimate. So we continue teaching remotely through the summer, but Anne Budino here, she led a survey and we asked students back in April, how is it going? And this is what they told us. Thank you for keeping us safe. We know that this is what you needed to do. We hate it. We don't <laughs> right, Anne? We don't like we don't like and this is not only our undergraduates, our graduate students as well. They said we, it's not the same for us. I have a lot of distractions, too much going on in my house, the internet, I find it this distracting. So it's not the same for me. I'm not getting the same experience. And and I, I know we were trying very hard to continue that same personalized experience, but it was not the same for them. So with that information, I knew that we needed to come back. And thankfully, the faculty were very supportive. And we all figured what we needed to do to restructure the places where we work, where students learn, where they eat, where they live. All students are in single rooms, so they minimize the possibility of contagion. And since we went back in August, there, there has been about 40 cases of positive the cases of COVID around campus in a community of 4,000. So this is about 1%, more or less. And even recently that we had, um, because of the recent spike in cases across the nation, we, we did a, a sample testing of students that were like certain uh, students that we thought perhaps would be more likely to test positive and still even those those group of students they they, they were they was called targeted testing it was less than six percent so we're we're doing great in terms of our containment of the contagion for one big reason our students have been incredibly supportive they wear their mask at all times Granted, we know our faculty and staff are not party animals, right, Sarah? I mean, I, this is this is what it is. They didn't want to, they, they didn't even want to test us. They said, oh, we're not worried about you guys, faculty and staff. But, you know, I'm so proud of our students. They're being so mature, so respectful. They know what they need to do to stay safe, and they're doing it. So, so it's been a really, uh, um, 
really amazing experience to to have you know 18 year olds that really are so mature and they're they're doing what they need to keep safe and it's been very rewarding that's a silver right. lining of leading through a pandemic <laughs> thank you so christina that's why is your son back on campus no he's not <laughs> so you know rest assured that if he decides to come back, he'll be safe. All right. We'll keep... yes. I'll let him know. Thank you. To meet you guys too, Patricia and Christina. I'm glad I got to hear your introductions. Sarah, right. and one question for you. The, the drawings that you do in your sketchbook, do you, are you expecting to, to use them as a kind of, will they become a, a big drawing later or are they going to stay in your sketchbook? That's a, that's a really good question. I, I would love to take them out of the sketchbook and put them, you know, frame them and put them larger on the wall. And then like, if I was thinking of an exhibition, I would then want to do probably one or two large scale drawings. Um, I can't do the large scale drawings easily right now. So that'll probably have to wait. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I've found with my work over the years is that when I try, like when I think about it too much, sometimes it, it loses a little bit of the magic and, and like its own, it's like, I'm discovering it. It's coming from me and it's coming from somewhere else. So sometimes when I plan out 2D work a little bit too much, I feel like it loses some of the magic. Probably what I would do, cause it also changes when you go to a different scale, like those pieces that I painted over um, that there was the one bird and then the darkness on one side, um, turbulence and shadow. Um, those pieces were, I was doing a lot of smaller scale drawings and I wanted to make larger ones of these because I, especially because I had this opportunity for this exhibition and it, it didn't do what I thought it would do. And I also, I talk again, like everything that I do, I tell my students this too, because sometimes in the, in the even on, in the lower foundation courses, this happens when you change the scale, it changes the work. Like with that installation that sold, it was a different installation and a different scale and, and how it related to the viewer. I think that I'll be inspired and I would love to do some large scale drawings. I don't know if it'll be, you know, that piece in particular, but it could be, but it probably wouldn't be this, you know, it definitely wouldn't be the same piece. Like that last piece that I showed you where the bird is really small, it's such a small drawing. And part of how it, it can be that, the way it looks I think is because of the scale. And, um, but yes and no, I think I'll, I think I would love to do some larger scale drawings. And I've, I've done some of those um, in the past. I think the largest drawing I've done is about five feet tall. And it's, it definitely is kind of exciting to work larger. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the drawings that are going on in the sketchbook. And I see them, I don't see them as staying in there necessarily. I'd like to do an exhibit with them in the next year or so. Do you have a stash of drawings or pieces that you started, you weren't happy with, and you just kind of store them away and say, I'm gonna revisit them? Yes, I do. I, I have. I have a lot of works on paper. Um, I like, it's like a journal. Sometimes I look back through them and think about different things I did that weren't successful necessarily, but I know that I might go back to it. Like I did some interesting cut paper pieces where I layered them over other drawings, like things that I never really made, created a body of work from them, but they relate to the work that I'm doing now. And um, those are more drawings. I mean, I don't wanna keep around a lot of canvases or works on panel um, that I'm not gonna use. I would probably just keep working on it and making another piece, but I do have a stack of drawings that are complete pieces and I probably won't ever do anything to them, but I keep them around, even though I wouldn't really show them in an exhibition necessarily. I kind of keep them for myself to maybe be like, oh yeah, I did that once. Oh, maybe I'll explore that again a little bit. Yeah. Same. So how old were you when you started drawing? And when did you realize being an artist was your calling? Yeah. Uh, at a very young age in terms of draw need to go to college. Uh, my parents were um, very much uh, 
don't know how to just say it. They just, they wanted me to study what I wanted to study, whatever that was. Um, my dad was a musician. My mom's kind of an artist and a musician. And they didn't by any means tell me to study art, but they just said, what, you know, what do you want to study? Where do you want to go? It wasn't like, uh, you know, you need to do this, this, and this by any means. And so I was, it was an open platform and I, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go to learn about something more. What do I want to learn more about? And so it was my favorite thing to do. Um, I was really good in math. Um, I loved math, but I wasn't, I wasn't really wanting to do that in my life. Um, but so yeah, I went to Skidmore that I studied art and I wasn't sure I wanted to be an artist. I never really thought I want to be an artist. I thought I want to learn more about art. And so then I went to Skidmore and it just kind of, it fell into place. I did decide when I was in a 2D class that I wanted to, to teach art because I helped some of the other students, which you see sometimes happen in class, someone's explaining. So I taught somebody how to blend paint and they were like, wow. And I did decide, I remember thinking I want to teach art. And then it was just a, a pathway to get there. Um, I, I went to graduate school thinking, I want to learn more about my own artistic practice. And if I am going to get a, a position teaching art, then I want to do that. Um, then I need to get a degree to do that. You kind of need to have that in hand. Um, and before that, I had been involved with teaching and kids and other levels, but I knew that I wanted to teach if I could at, at the college level. Um, so what happened was after I graduated from Skidmore, so I went there to study more about art. I definitely, there's a whole slew of experiences that, that happened there that I won't really get into, but I'd be happy to talk about it some other time um, of really what made me bring content into my work. I had a very distinct experience of being a freshman and being like, I don't know what to make work about. I just wanna draw something that I see. And that was like very confusing to me. And then getting some life experience to be like, oh, I need to make work about this. And then um, going and living with other artists after I graduated in Boston, we moved to Boston after Skidmore. And I think because I was in a community with other artists, I mean, we had a, we shared a, an apartment together, but they were doing it and that was really helpful. I think being an artist takes a lot of effort, uh, minimal and a lot. I mean, you just, you just gotta do it. If you don't do it, then you're not doing it. <laughs> it's like with anything, if you don't exercise, it's not just gonna happen unless you live in New York City and then you walk everywhere. But it really helped. So I lived, we had an arts collaborative and that really helped catapult me into, into being an artist after I graduated. The, I think the community, being inspired by other people, having some opportunities to show and living in, a, in an area, you know, Boston was, was pretty good for me at the time. Um, I moved to New York because I had moved back to Boston after grad school and it wasn't enough for me at that time. But in, after undergrad for, the, for art, that was, that was kind of when it happened, I think. Being, being a professional artist. I showed something in, in undergrad, you know, and I made work, but it was all about discovery then. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everybody, uh, Anne, Barry, Anne-Marie, John, Carol, Christina, and Patricia for joining us tonight. I want to show you um, a really quick slide here. You should all, I hope, can see this. Um, get your smartphones out if you have if you have one and uh, follow us on our social media. We have a few different channels here. Um, I'll leave this slide up, give you time to get your phone <laughs> um, because we really want you to follow us. We have a lot of different events like this and others that we're offering to the community now, particularly since we can't physically be together. Uh, we're putting out great stories about our alumni um, new graduates, alumni of uh, black and white photograph time and um, Roddy Tuesdays featuring our generous supporters. So I want you to be able to share in all of that. Um, so we have Instagram, we have Twitter, Facebook, and then we do have a LinkedIn alumni group. So for those of you who have uh, kids in particular who are going to be graduating soon or new graduates, make sure they're a part of our alumni network LinkedIn page so that they can meet fellow alumni and, and network. Um, but thank you again for joining us and um, certainly keep an eye out also for our monthly e-newsletter. If you are not getting it, check your spam. And then if it is not showing up there, um, let us know and we will certainly make sure you're on the list to get it. But if you got this email, you should be getting to invite you to this, you should be getting the e-newsletter. 
Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you thank you, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Sarah. It was thank phenomenal. You. I enjoyed so much listening about your art. Thank it was you. great to see you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all.